because everything works. So, um, good morning, everybody. Um, following hard on the heels of World Book Day, which was yesterday, and I hope everybody dressed up as a character, um, <laughs> today is International Women's Day. Um, and both of these books and um, female authors give me more, more uh, excuse than I need to have a, a chat with Linda Proud and welcome her to um, Facebook Live. Uh, Linda, you are one of my favorite authors, so this is a great privilege for me. Um, uh, you've published five novels, um, including an extraordinary uh, quartet set in Renaissance Italy. And I believe you identified that this is a first edition. I'm very, very proud of this uh, tabernacle for the sun. You've written and published nonfiction, uh, including a highly regarded book on angels. Um, children's literature, and I have an example of that. I brought my props, you see, this morning, children's <laughs> literature. A wonderful illustrated book on England called Consider England and, and a lot more. You've also taught creative writing extensively, and I know from conversations with some of your students that you've provided guidance and inspiration to many people. And you ran a publishing house, uh, which gave a platform to some really lovely poets and storytellers. So. As I say, it's a treat for me. And you're a dear friend, can I add that? Uh, uh, mm -hmm. People who've seen my previous uh, Philosophy Live broadcasts will know that I tend to surmise what the author thinks and feels. There's scholarship involved, obviously, and I read their diaries and journals and interpret their works. But the great thing about this moment is that I have the author here um, with me, next to me on the screen more questions and I'll be able to fit into the time that we have allocated. But let me just, let me start. And I'd like to start with questions about the writing process. And it's a kind of a compound question. And it's really this, it's how do you find your inspiration? You know, how do you get ideas? And how does it feel in the sense that ideas are ideas, but what happens? How do you know that you've got an idea that you want to run with? Is that, is that okay? Is that? Yeah, that's fine. I think ideas are coming at us all the time, can be a bit of a blizzard sometimes, but think of it as tree seed floating through the air. And most of them lodge in the brain and become unfertile. You know, you, you start off, oh, new project, scribble, 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 and then get bored and abandon it. Um, and some lodge in the heart, very, very few lodge in the heart. And you know that when you find them, you know they're there. And you know you'll see it right through to the end, whatever. However many drafts it takes to get it right, you'll get you'll stay with it to the end. And uh, so I don't go looking for ideas. Well, sometimes I do. <laughs> um, usually it's just coming at you. It's a question of distinguishing which are going to die and which are going to last. So you, you do write, you, so you, you, you engage with them in the first instance, sometimes as a sketch and sometimes it it's just be some of them. Oh yes, I'm going to, I mean, I would, for instance, I would love to write a classic children's story. I would love that. Instead, I write these really dense books of histo historical fiction. Um, so any attempt to write a classical children's story or any children's story, apart from Knights of the Grail, doomed to failure. Just it's, I just can't do it. It's not, it's not for me. So there's, yeah, there's the author who says, this is what I'd like to do. And, mm. but then there are, the, the stories tell you what they want uh, to be, I suppose. They're, they're looking for fertile ground, these ideas. Yeah. Yes. Where, so they're where there. That this will be developed. Yeah. And they find you. Um, if I could, do you mind, Linda, if I just reference something we were talking about a little earlier, which is by the work being driven by a question. And, and how, if there's a powerful question at the heart of what you're exploring, that that is something that lodges in the heart, you know. Mm. Could you say a little bit about that? Because I think that's that's hugely interesting. Well, you were asking me what what started me off with uh, the Renaissance trilogy, and was I just interested in the period? But no, I was interested in the Pre-Raphaelites, and it's my early 20s, and just kind of waking up to being a, an intelligent grown-up. <laughs> <laughs> still working on that one um, and I just wondered what pre-Raphael meant 
um, and I went off to the, to the library and found that artists before Raphael included Botticelli, who I also liked. So I just started reading everything I could about Botticelli. Um, but it's all about his serpentine lines and his plasticity and nothing about the man. And that was the beginning of the quest, really. It's just who was this person? When did he live? Who was around at the same time? That took me to the Medici and the Humanists and Marsilio Ficino, the Neoplatonist, who was largely behind Botticelli's uh, thinking and and responses to things, beauty in particular. Um, so it was kind of that you you hearing these questions and you're going off trying to find answers and out of that the story starts to build. Okay, I've, I think that's that's really interesting. When you say, I mean, you start off as a factual inquiry, so this is research and and it's driven by a desire to know more. And a desire to know more in a, in a human sense, not just the allocation of data, information, dates, and who did what, when, but what does it feel like to have lived in that time? And then instead of writing a, a non-fiction book that adds to the kind of body of work on the subject, you you allow that, or something happens, they, they take shape and they take life. These historical people become characters. Could, could, you, could you speak yeah. about that? Because I think that's really interesting. Well, the problem with history is it's usually just the bones and not the soul. Um, and for good reason, there's no documentary evidence for how someone felt. Um, or what moved them or what scared them. So you go into this kind of other state of inquiry and knowing, which is a more psychological state. And really, I'm tempted to say put yourself in their position, but you have to be an actor of many parts to do that. But there's usually something. I don't really know how the magic works, but it is magic. But you get clues that it is working when you uncover things that turn out to have been factually true and you didn't know it at the time. Um, yeah, best I can do. No. no, I think that's lovely. Well, yes, in, in a way you suddenly find that the actuality plays out according to the laws of story that you're you're writing to. Yes. And and also when we do ask about the creative processes, we always we come to that point where you can't explain it. And I think it's mm. important to it's important to allow that inexplicability to sit at the yeah. heart of, of the writing because Otherwise, you know, it's like taking a fly apart to find out how it flies <laughs> <laughs> it would not survive the uh, an anatomical inquiry oh. <laughs> so yes and that, that's the in a way that's the childlike nature of the very serious undertaking of writing that there's a playfulness as well at heart you allow it to be <clears throat> Can I just, I mean, we could speak about this for a long time, but I'd like to move to another area of your, of your writing, um, which is um, about England, about this this country where we sit. And the country, England, Britain, UK, has, has undergone a bit of historical revision uh, recently. For example, the National Trust giving more context to the provenance of the houses. You know, where did all this wealth and glory come from, who paid for it. Um, I live in Bristol and, and not so long ago, uh, the, the good people of this fair city uh, chucked the statue of a slave <laughs> into the murky waters of the harbour side um, to the sound of cheering. And um, it, but this is where this is where the sort of understanding of, of, of this country is, is sort of resting at the moment. But you've taken it further back and, and I think in a way deeper because there is another England isn't there of myth and folklore and sacred places. We've got Avery, Avebury uh, just nearby with its stones. And I'd love to go there. It's one of my favorite places. It's a short drive. And there is something about being there. You feel it's been here for a very long time, but for good reason. So, and actually Avebury is features, doesn't it, into this book, which is, yeah. I guess, 
partly what I'm speaking about. And I just wondered if you could tell us a bit about that, you know, about your questions and your exploration. Yeah. That this um, story I'm just finishing part two of now is set in the first century AD. And the characters there who are at Avebury are further, a longer period of time between them and the people who built, built Avebury than between them and us. Okay. So as far as they were concerned, it was the unknown ancients who built that place. Um, there was no England at that time. That comes in the fifth century. So what we're looking at is Britain and Britain's in, influence, is that the right word, on, on England and Englishness. Um, it's, you get this kind of, I think it's almost peculiar to United Kingdom, but there are, will be other places in the world who have these kind of circles of identification with who you are. Um, I mean, sitting here today in this place, I'm a, I'm a Wolvercotian. I'm an inhabitant of Wolvercot. And that is quite distinct to being someone who lives in Oxford, which is uh, one mile up the road. Um, and there have been battles fought over that. <laughs> 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 and and then, then you're kind of in the kind of southeast or Thames Valley type, as opposed to the north. Um, and then you're in this bigger area of um, Great Britain, which is just the island. But the United Kingdom is the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. So the splodge over the other side of the Irish Sea. Um, so what do we identify with? I, I really appreciate what you're saying about England's roots are in ancient Britain because that's exactly, that's exactly right, they are. History has taught us that England came with the Anglo-Saxons, certainly the name of the place did, and um, an awful lot of um, a few qualities came with them, but also a lot of regression because they wiped out the Roman civilization. Um, deliberately and dramatically, took the stones down, built in wood, um, got rid of Christianity, went back to paganism. Um, and that kind of light, dark, binary, Mediterranean, Northern European balance is always going on in our history. Um, but of course, Christianity came back into Britain. England by this time, uh, not through St. Augustine, but through what we now call the Christian, Celtic Christian saints, Cuthbert, Aden, Columba. And that got driven out by Augustine and Rome, um, got squashed. So got is this interesting um, balance going on, trying to achieve balance between these two apparent opposing forces, which my hero, Toggy Dubness, who was a real character, now completely forgotten, um, for the residents of Chichester, yeah, yes. and actually, um, a famous best <laughs> um, His work within himself is to achieve that balance, to be a Roman and a Briton both. Um, whereas his contemporaries like Caractacus and Boudicca are all for getting rid of the oppressor. Their way leads to genocide of the Druids, mass slaughter of, I think, 80,000 killed by Boudicca. 80,000 Britons were killed by Boudicca and her, her army. Um, and it's a bloodbath. Whereas Toggy Dubnus is a, a quiet negotiator, he, according to what has been told to me in the imagination, he studied with Seneca in Rome and is applying Stoic principles to his 
role as a king of southern Britain. Um, and he's just trying always to negotiate his way through these opposing forces. With, you know, some success, some failure. Um, but I find that all completely fascinating and completely relevant to what's going on today. Yes. Yeah. Mm. That that was a, a, a question that I was going to put to you about how writing about the past speaks to the present, but I think you've you've answered that. Yeah, yeah, but also the the present speaks to the past. I mean, I understand the past by reading about present day conflicts, but they are there's nothing peculiar to them being in this time. They're forever recurring, and it's always the same kind of battle between order and disorder, um, yin and yang. Yin and yang, and it's, a, it, yes, uh, in which the, the thing about yin and yang as a concept, as, as I understand, it, it's, 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 it's liminal, it's, it's movement because there's the seeds of one in the other. And yeah. So the Roman Empire comes over here and basically does a lot of damage, but there is law there are good things and mm. um the check and history of modern england you know they're, they're, but there i suppose what is important um in when considering one's own nation is to ask what the quintessence of it is because there must be that which is based on a spiritual understanding would you say or is that naive um no no um if I've understood the question, there's something about, or perhaps I'm doing a politician's trick of bending bending your question to what I want to answer. <laughs> but there's something about this place, this sceptered isle, that changes people. And you can be English, no matter what your birth roots are if you follow three as i understand it three principal things one is to live under the law to worship god in whatever way um is appropriate to you and i've forgotten the third <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure it's to do with language because it seems to me that England's duty in the world if you like I mean it's pretty good on law and justice but it's 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 the word it's writing drama <coughs> and what we've done for the world when I say we I'm <laughs> talking about the greats um you know Shakespeare Blackstone, Bacon, um, oh, Bunyan, I mean, this goes on and on, doesn't it, and all the poets you've been mentioning in this series. Uh, it's as if, somehow or other, this is our gift to humanity. And if you come, if you come from somewhere else, and you live here, and you live under those three cultural laws, if you like, you're as English as someone who's been here for four or five generations. But there's no such thing as a pure English person, thank God. Um, we're all mongrel. Well, uh, uh, yes, I think that's lovely, as indeed our language is. It's, it's a hybrid mm. of so many different things, and yet put to purpose. But in a way, it's mongrelness is part of its charm, that you can have so many slightly nuanced words for the same thing, and they all mean a different they have a different yeah. flavour. It's so style. hard to learn the language. So simple and so hard all at once. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm quoting from Consider England. You spoke of the quintessence of, of England, uh, like a golden thread only visible when the sun shines on it, which I think is a lovely, it's a lovely description. It's the same thing that we've been talking about in a way with thinking and creativity and writing, that there's this there is the center of it, something that you only recognize when you turn your eye to it, but it's always there, it's always present. Mm. So I always get, um, or I don't teach anymore, but when I was teaching, 
I used to get particularly grumpy with people who abused the language. And I can't, we haven't got the time now to discuss what that abuse might be. But I just think it's the writer's duty to um, be a steward of the language somehow. It is changing, it will change. Yes. Even punctuation's changing. Yes, you um, can't fix it. You don't, you don't look after it by fixing it. No, exactly right. But you, you use it to speak the truth. Yeah. And that would look after everything. Yeah. I think we'll leave it at that on that note. We have to we have to finish. <laughs> we could go on all, all day. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna draw this to a close. Um just to say to, to um our viewers, um you can you can you can get hold of Linda's books, um Amazon, uh, Central Books, um I think I like to go to my local bookshop and order through them. So you keep your local bookshops alive. Yeah. There are ebook versions on Kindle. Um, so a couple of the novels are on um, iBooks, I've noticed. Um, but if you want to go to lindaproud.com and you can communicate with Linda there if you, if you wish, but you can order signed copies, which I think would, you know, and like I have, you know, <laughs> your collection. That's the Linda, thank you so much for joining us um, this morning. It's a real pleasure. Thank you. And 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 to, to, to everyone out there, um, have a very good day. Thank you for your company to Philosophy Live, I have to say, is here uh, every Friday morning during term time. Um, so have a good day and a lovely weekend. Thank you.